All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds at the Semmel Institute and Department of Psychiatry. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce this morning's speaker, Dr. Suma Jacob, and to welcome her again to UCLA as the new Division Director for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Jacob earned her PhD in neurobiology and her MD at the University of Chicago, and she trained with us here at UCLA before heading back to the Midwest for her child fellowship training and transition to a faculty appointment. At Minnesota, she was the Gloria and Dr. Martin Siegel Endowed Chair, Associate Director of the Medical Scientist Training Program, and Chief Medical and Science Officer at Fraser, one of the largest nonprofit community mental health programs in Minnesota. Dr. Jacobs' research focuses on social neuroscience, behavioral neuroendocrinology, and neurodevelopmental disorders. And today she'll be talking to us about interventions in heterogeneous neurodevelopmental disorders. Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this talk. And I'm really excited to be back at UCLA um, from over 20 years ago. Um, so it's very, very fun. Um, it, so the topic I'm talking about is investigating interventions in a heterogeneous um, population, which is neurodevelopmental disorders. But this topic applies to a lot of the issues we're having with clinical trials and finding out, finding clinical interventions for all populations. So I'm gonna start talking about the complexity of studying neurodevelopmental disorders like autism. Um, in addition to all the etiological heterogeneity there is, the one thing that we do um, in child and adolescent is think about development and adding the complexity of the developmental timeline on top of those other complex challenges. And um, I'll share some thinking about that as well as review what we've learned from recent clinical trials, including very large clinical trials, as many of you are familiar with, that's the trend we've gone in, in doing clinical trials, but also the benefit of smaller, more focused mechanistic studies. And then um, we will also talk about current challenges. So if we do have so much heterogeneity and complexity, how do we parse that into subgroups? How do we identify targets or find biomarkers or um, common streams or circuits of plasticity across the specific disorders or multiple disorders? Um, and then with development, we really want to look at the best time or the optimal, optimal critical period for doing interventions, because we have a possibility to shift trajectories. And then I will touch upon very briefly the challenges of really engaging and working with stakeholders and the clinical population. And as many of you know, as in other psychiatric disorders, adults with autism have strong views that are often different than parents and children with autism. And so how do you bring in that information and in thinking about how we do this work? So um, thinking about how we train in psychiatry, we often learned um, adult disorders first and then go into neurodevelopment. And in a way, I've always thought that that is kind of a different reverse way than how it naturally happens, where you actually think of fetal early development all the way to adulthood. And as a developmentalist, I actually think adult is a lot of development. You have reproductive years, you have other years, you have um, you know, grandparent, elder years and decline in certain areas. So this framework of constant change as opposed to thinking things are static is an approach. And when traditional research tried to have really nice clean groups and exclude a lot of comorbidities, and with children, that's almost impossible because a child doesn't walk in with one disorder or one symptom. We are frequently addressing many different um, comorbidities, but also every child varies on developmental spectrums across different domains, like emotional, um, cognitive, or social. So there's all that variability. And so this idea of excluding and having a lot of exclusion criteria has not worked well because it doesn't then translate so easily to, uh, to our clinical populations we see. So when you think about this whole phase of going from prenatal to older life, 
Um, there are the disorders that come very early, which have been defined as neurodevelopmental. Um, we have we see a lot of behavioral challenges that may or may not warrant diagnostic categories in childhood. And then as you get older, there are severe disorders in mood or with psychosis. And, um, and, and we know that like with aging and dementia and decline, all of these are changing. So when you think about the biology of this, there's genetic risk at all of these different phases. There's environmental shifts at all of these phases. And um, most disorders start um, before the age 18. Um, so there, if you really go back and look, there are precursors or risk factors that are early, and that's the time of onset. But then a lot of our disorders also recur, and um, some wax and wane, and some um, continue at different points in life. And so what's, what's fun about studying neurodevelopment is you can really look at when disorders first emerge. And so um, anxiety is a great example because many of you have seen babies that have separation anxiety and sometimes it becomes clinically impairing. But as you get older, um, selective mutism, social phobia, generalized anxiety, it's a continuum. And many individuals with anxiety disorders have more than one of these and they build on each other. Um, and so a lot of these happen, it's emerge at very specific times in the developmental period. And um, as a, a behavioral neuroendocrinologist who studied reproductive hormones and physiology, as well as other hormones, there are huge differences when you look at puberty and what happens before puberty and after puberty. And in, in terms of clinical things, things that work for adults in say mood disorders, may similar types of treatments may work well for young kids, but adolescents are their own unique period and translating just down doesn't seem to work for some of our disorders. And so I really like, I call myself a developmentalist and sort of think about it, but in what are the things that are happening in typical development? And if you really think about these early emerging disorders, um, very early, our focus of the brain is sensory motor, actually before even that, it's arousal. And then as communication emerges, you start seeing the disorders that affect communication challenges or language. And then you see the disorders that really affect social play or engagement and motor skills. And um, as a biologist, I also think it's really interesting that these tick disorders and ADHD and OCD emerge at a time when we have adrenarchy. So hormones are being kicked out by the adrenals even way before we hit puberty. Um, as you get older, there are all the learning disabilities or challenges or academic and cognitive things. I love OCD because the things that are the focus in OCD are related to wherever you are in your developmental phase. So kids are really terrified of illness or death at a certain age. And as they mature, it becomes about um, relationships or sexual behaviors. And so if you add this lens, you get a real sense of how these disorders emerge. And they're very tightly patterned to what is having to, happening developmentally at that period um, as you go into adulthood. And this is really focusing on when they emerge. It doesn't mean that you can't have depression or psychosis earlier. Um, you can, but it doesn't look the same as it does in adults. So depression in young kids often looks like irritability, and it's not the way adult depression looks. And so um, thinking about this framework is really important. I trained in an era where MD-PhDs were trained to kind of really think about bench, bench to bedside and then applying back out to the population. And where we've gotten really challenged is our disorders are very heterogeneous. So it's very hard to find a single gene or a single treatment that works for everyone. And there's variability, not at every level. Of course, for behavior, there's a ton of variability, but for clinical presentation, there is. And then every level of biology from systems down to molecular, there's variability. Um, and so capturing that or thinking about how we address that is going to be really important. We're also in the era of this big data. And 
For the first time with technology, we can get huge numbers and volumes of data, and we can even get it in real time. And it's an incredible opportunity. But what do we do with all this data? How do we approach it? How do we clean it? How do we think about questions? And then how do we use it to think about prevention, diagnosis, and treatment? And so um, with development, there are sensitive periods. We have incredible data on the brain that says there are periods of early childhood where communication is easier to acquire, especially in certain modalities. And there, it's easier to learn certain things at certain at specific ages. And so as um, my colleagues and I have done some of these larger studies, for looking at early childhood, we've had the opportunity to use technology to look at community-based samples and look at a lot of parents and kids, and then bring that back into the lab to do more specific, specific kind of ask questions and measures, and then try to look at what predicts early for later challenges. And um, with that, um, uh, Jed Ellison and Jason Wolf um, through the Institute of Child Development, we were able to do um, look at large groups of kids, like over 3,000 18 month olds, and follow them out to age three and look for predictors of what give, puts you at risk for communication disorders or autism or other challenges like ADHD or these early emerging neurodevelopmental. Things we've learned so far. The kids that show up have early presentations often have more severe presentations. Um, some have more cognitive intellectual disability challenges. And the kids that we pick up later um, have different profiles. So uh, we're also with the big data in this era of new statistics and computational measures where you can put in all this data and look at what emerges and think about what patterns go together. And um, similarly, one period is not the only period for an intervention. So I've done very early childhood studies, but I also, there are windows in adolescent brain period and early adulthood where um, you are more sensitive and open that literally goes to increased cognitive functioning that you could tap into and it's easier to learn certain things. So a lot of the intervention studies, the neurobiology informs which time period I target and also the methods that I'm, or what I'm targeting at that time. So I'm gonna focus today on clinical trials just because it has such an important um, effect on what we think about treatments. And um, my more basic science work or translational work in the last, decade plus has been on oxytocin and vasopressin. So my PhD work is in behavioral neuroendocrinology and animal and human pheromones and other types of hormones like estrogen and drastodienone. But I had this incredible opportunity to work with oxytocin and be mentored by Sue Carter, who's one of the, the most well-known people who've studied oxytocin and voles in animals. And um, I'm gonna focus on human studies, but I really wanna emphasize that how I think about um, these particular molecules are very much based on evolution and what they've done across the lifespan of different mammalian species. And so oxytocin has really been thought of as a prosocial hormone, but it's really a modulator and it has many different tasks of bonding, um, affiliative behaviors, whereas vasopressin is much more about territories, um, aggression, and, and in a way they are, they are the same genetic structure. The gene just flipped nine amino acids, one amino acid different. And so even though they have very different functions and what we learn in, in medical school is about vasopressin and water regulation, in the brain, they have very interesting patterns. So vasopressin has been shown to affect paternal behavior in voles. Um, and Larry Young, who recently passed away, did a, a huge amount of work on that. And oxytocin, again, in the brain does, uh, that does this. And they talk to each other. So if you block one receptor, um, it, it, it binds to the other receptor, 
So I had the opportunity to partner with um, industry on a very, very large, it's the largest clinical trial in autism. And um, one of the things to know is that there are no drugs that target the core symptoms of autism, which tend to be social communication and restrictive behavior, repetitive behaviors. We have medications that target aggression or irritability that are antipsychotics, and we have and we've targeted these other symptoms through behavioral interventions. But um, there's been this hope to find medications that target core symptoms. And so both oxytocin and vasopressin have had a lot of research done to see if it could affect social, social communication and behaviors. And this particular study is the phase three study. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about it because it's large and it was a really interesting partnership with industry because from day one, they sat down with um, clinical and academic experts in design and thought through all the phases of the study. And so there were three trials when I've been, I was involved in all three. The very first one, um, which was done about a decade ago, was the very first trial with adults with autism. So if you can imagine, historically, trials are done with parents, the rating scales are with parents and parents are telling you how the kids are doing. So it was figuring out what the rating scales are, what your outcome measure is, and then also the challenge of dosing. And that first trial, they use a social responsive scale and clinical trials are very set on, you have one primary outcome. It either is go or no go, it, it, that works, your trial succeeds, that doesn't, it, it, does, it fails. And so you even design it to have that and have secondary exploratory. And after that first trial, that SRS did not, was not the measure they thought worked. A lot of research was put into what measure would work. Um, and the idea was ultimately to, to do children, which was the second study, and um, five to 17. And there is even attempt at doing pharmacokinetics in very young kids to see how early you can give it. Um, and that was very challenging because very young kids don't like blood draws. So it's just interesting to think about the whole lifespan you deal with in neurodevelopmental disorders. The third study, which I'm gonna talk about most was um, terminated midway at 50% because the results did not look promising for the primary outcome. But it is still the largest study done in autism. And these collectively give us a lot of insight into doing clinical trials. So the design, um, current clinical trials want to move fast and how they move fast is lots of sites. Very different from trials 20 to 30 years ago where you had five or 10 academic centers that were the main sites that did all the work. So as you have more sites, you can recruit more people, but the variability of course increases. And um, again, there was attempts to make sure that there was some, um, standardization of IQ and dis disorder severity and even social impairment um, after this dose was found. Um, but the challenge of finding outcome measures is huge. We Most of our outcome measures are rating scales. And how do you find a good rating scale of something that's changing like social communication? So what the first one that did not work, which was the SRS for this study, um, people looked at over 9,000 Vinelands, which is a developmental scale, which was not designed to be a clinical trial outcome sale, but looked to see if it moved or changed. And a composite factor for social communication was used and determined to be the target. And then again, there's a huge list of different um, secondary uh, things that people would think, like uh, vasopressin could affect anxiety, um, quality of life, all those things. And then the analysis was standardized and said, this is the exact analysis we're gonna do. Um, trials are very regulated that way. And so out of over 500 participants, about a third to a little more than a third didn't pass the screening for those criteria and over 300 were enrolled. And again, just noting that this was about the, since the study was stopped halfway, there would have been even more if it was continued all the way through. And you can look at both the attempt to make sure that the placebo versus the balavaptin and the vasopressin agonist, antagonist trial were the same group, um, about the same 
um, received a discontinued treatment, 50 to 65. And so when I go through similarities in both groups, which is really important when you're comparing them, the IQ is relatively the same, age was relatively the same, um, the sex at birth ratio was relatively the same, and race and ethnicity was relatively the same. So again, the groups weren't that different. And then you look at all of these safety and tolerability things. Um, I remember in you end up doing a lot of detailed work in clinical trials, and sometimes it's frustrating. But one of the things I learned is you do it so if the trial gets approved, the clinician later doesn't have to worry about EKGs. They don't have to worry about those other things because it's already been um, demonstrated in the trial. And so the results, when you look at it, um, favored placebo. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at that 2DC standard social communication, this is at 50%, they stopped, huge international trial. And um, it looked like it was going slightly the other way. Of course, it's not significant in that direction. Um, the secondary results, again, were not very promising in the sense of, um, you know, some, some of these placebo, if you eyeball it, looks better than um, Belavaptin, but neither were statistically significant. Um, and the severity of the participants, um, it didn't change or improve or make a huge difference. Um, safety note, which is really important because this drug might be useful for other targets. Both were um, showed relatively similar pro profiles for adverse events. So it was a pretty safe drug in comparison. Um, so why, what could happen with a trial like this? Um, a lot of our trials are negative. And so when you look at it, there's placebo response, um, which is different from expectation bias, which I'll talk a little bit about. Look at all the site types, 46 sites. What did we learn? Um, how were participants recruited? And in the modern age, we have um, web recruitment versus our traditional academic sites. Um, baseline differences, how you start, does that make a difference? And then again, I mentioned the outcome measure is huge. So when you look at outcome measures, um, there are very few ones to choose from and they need to be developed. There's very little funding for developing outcome measures. So this has been a huge challenge in our field. Well, the other big challenge in developmental disorders is you're not, kids can't often rate and tell you how they are. Adults on the spectrum can't often rate and have reflection on the targets. You need other people to do that in addition to them. Um, the classic thing in child is if you have a father rate it and a mother rate it, they're very different. So, you know, it's terrible if they're alternating because you don't know what's happening at all. So the rating scale challenge is huge. And the future hopes to use things like digital ratings as just a simple thing, but other markers that are less rating scale um, driven. And an example is, um, I think about this all the time, um, if you asked me to rate how anxious I was while we were getting tech set up, while we were st while I'm standing here talking, um, I can tell you what I think how anxious I am or how I think I feel or after the talk when it's all over. But I also have this watch on my arm, which tells me when I don't even realize that my heart rate was high and I later realized it was when I was giving a talk. Um, so it's just incredible what digital technology allows us to do in terms of capturing things that we don't even realize ourselves. Um, when you look at all three trials and you go back to this 2DC composite score, if you actually go back and look at the vanilla early, the very first phase two trial, there's a lot of variability. Look at how wide that standard deviation is. And then with kids, it didn't move it, but it's a little less variability. And this last study, which favored placebo, um, again, you see that, that variability at 12 and 24 months. Um, but, the, but it's interesting that that first trial captured such a wide range. So did people start who started in the different groups look different? And again, that's a way to look at, we went back and had all these different trials for the same drug, very similar design. And individuals that had um, 
had had lower scores to start with, had more room to move and change from baseline. So in a disorder where you have a wide range of functioning and levels and ability, who starts and where, where they are makes a huge difference when you think about the scale. So I'm gonna spend a little time talking about placebo response because this is huge. Um, one of the papers I read said that 40 to 50% of placebo response in most trials and in pediatrics, it's even higher often because you have parental expectation as well as child, you know, what's going on with the child and all the things that are changing. Um, in this study, we were really lucky because we could compare all the sites, um, qualities of the sites, as well as um, what the baseline characteristics were. If the participant was recruited from a private site, so these are CROs, um, clinical trials are incredibly expensive. So there are um, different organizations that are now private clinical trial organizations versus academic centers like UCLA. There was greater placebo in those private uh, effect in those private institutions. Similarly, if you're recruited from the website versus you're part of a um, clinical group, you're already a patient at UCLA and you hear about a study, there was more very there was more placebo response. So if you came from if that's how you were recruited. Um, what's fun with thinking about new statistical models is uh, Russell Tobe and other colleagues took all this data again across all studies and did a data-driven approach. Um, it's, it's specifically a lasso regression. And what's fun is they pulled together every all the participants from five through adulthood. And they found that decreased placebo was predicted by a higher baseline starting. So this is in contrast to what I said to you before, there's more change if you start with a lower, but you had less placebo if you started high, higher. So you could see that the outcome measure selection and some of the challenges with the outcome measure and its ability created a lot of variability. The longer duration, so the longer you're in a trial, less likely to have a placebo effect. The European sites were better than the US sites they had less placebo effect. Um, increased placebo, again, the commercial CROs were higher than academic, but this was what was really fun about putting it together the full developmental age. Um, the, the pediatric study had a lot of kids who had comorbid ADHD or were taking ADHD meds. And um, both having ADHD or depression, which was captured a lot with adults, increased, increased placebo effect. So our comorbidities really affect how um, people respond to treatment. And so expectation bias, why is this different from placebo and other things? Um, before it went to the last, before it went to phase three, um, this drug was given breakthrough treatment therapy status. So people were really excited about it. And again, that's going to influence outcomes and who's in the trial and Along with all the other variables, there's been a lot of work in Fragile X, um, in particular, where parents and community have a lot of expectation, and um, that's really affect, affected how the trials are done. Um, and even how people get into trials are affected by, it, pe parents are on different groups, they will learn the best answer to get into uh, to resources. And so again, that creates these huge challenges when we're doing these studies. So again, limitations, heterogeneity, big sample size across the world. Um, this one was stopped during futility and uh, of futility analysis. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. There's huge placebo responses, not just in pediatric trials, but in adult trials. Um, where you recruit, um, what your outcome measure is, and how we determine them. This study, this treatment still had a slight trend for improvement in quality of life. And I'll talk a little bit about how that comes up when you don't have a, good, a very narrow outcome measure. And again, no safety concerns. Um, so when you, I'm going to contrast this with a smaller study that I did that was related with some of the mechanism animal work. So I just want to uh, do a call out to Karen Bales, who's at UC Davis, who I was able to work in a study with TD monkeys, which are pictured there, and um, voles, which she, we met through Sue Carter, 
um, earlier in her training, and Liz Hammock, who we were able to do genetic knock-in and knock-out experiments, really thought about how oxytocin works. And with Evdakia Agnostu, we were able to do a clinical trial with intranasal oxytocin in adolescence. So again, it's a narrower age, but, we, but the interesting effect that we found was a task that really allowed you to see same or different and it's you you have to identify similarities in faces and there was an effect of an ability to see similarity in faces or differences in faces that was not shown in houses and we were also really able to track this with the amount of that they had oxytocin in their system over the trial so this is a much smaller trial and an example of using a task based outcome measure which you know, clinicians will say that's not practical. Who wants to do a task at an office? We'd much rather do a rating scale. But in terms of drug discovery and finding out what works, I think tasks are really important to think about. Um, interestingly, quality of life was also one of our big effects. So I really think we don't have the best target outcome for this drug. We haven't figured out what is really changing. Um, and so design of future studies are going to be important. And to highlight this, there was a very large intranasal oxytocin study done with some of my esteemed colleagues. They went for a wide age range, 3 to 17. Um, the outcome measures were the standard measures. One was this ABC social withdrawal, which is the most commonly used outcome measure. It's developed a long time ago with um, lithium antipsychotic drugs. And actually it's almost like a, a level of engagement and arousal, what's really capturing in the social withdrawal. But our study with the smaller adolescent study, nor their study did social withdrawal pick up anything. Different formulations of oxytocin, just huge. What's getting in, how's it working? Different sample, um, wide range of IQ because um, um, Dr. Sikich was trying to really find something for kids that had more intellectual disability. So she really wanted um, young kids with more severe intellectual disability. Um, were there a subgroup of responders? Um, and again, I constantly say hormones were not meant to be pills that you take once. Those of you who know like insulin is highly regulated. You have to optimize it with when you take it and how you take it what we do in the environment is highly effective. And just a quick note on placebo, when I was doing research on placebo, um, not just behavioral things or biological things that are affect, like, affected by behavior, like hypertension is affected by placebo. Hemoglobin A1C, a study has shown, has, been, has a placebo response. So I think our physiology that's deeply affected by how we live and, and behave day to day also has sensitivity. Uh, liver, hepatocyte pathology as well. So what are our next steps? Um, how are we gonna think about these challenging questions? So we have to address heterogeneity in our studies. We have to come up with clearly targetable symptoms and what we're gonna target. Um, we have to deal with comorbidities and come up with designs that think about these different complex issues, um, develop new measures beyond rating scales, um, that, that are both specific as well as more general, like quality, quality of life as well as targeting, and then new um, markers, biological and digital. Some of the new trials have EEG biomarkers, so it's something that's not coming up on a rating scale that we can use that has additional data, but digital biomarkers are really gonna be the future of how we think about some of these things. So again, um, we've known for a long time the challenge of doing norms and sort of averages and means and translating that down to an individual. One size doesn't fit all in medicine. We've really been in this era of stratified medicine where we're beginning to look at subgroups, but how do we bring that to personalized and capture all the complexity? Um, new waves, adaptive design, for clinical trials. Um, and this is, you know, they they stopped the trial early to do an interim analysis. And, and a lot of that was driven by how expensive it is to do these trials. But the future designs are going to have very iterative ways of doing interim analysis, tweaking, and moving on.
And what's really fun about it is I've been reading more about new mathematical models. So Bayes Bayesian versus frequentist trials. And there's been even a trial of um, stroke and hypoglycemic insulin related. It's a huge network trial where they did a traditional tri a clinical trial, which is con considered more the frequentist, which is if you have a hypothesis, it's true or false. Bayesian thinks of what's the probability your hypothesis is true. So there's a flexibility to it. And um, they did the same trial in these two different, actually two different trials, both different methods. The difference with the Bayesian is they were able to come to similar outcomes with fewer participants faster. So I think that this is sort of the wave of the future. What are the downsides of doing these very complex things? Very difficult, you have to make these decisions as trial leaders. You can't have this very rigid standard protocol across 46 sites and easily pull something like this off. Um, so there are the logistical challenges of doing it. But I really think for the early phases of thinking about uh, of trials, this is a direction that we're gonna go in because it's a little bit like implementation science. You don't wait to get everything done to make a decision and replicate it three or four times. You're doing these interim analyses and trying to make decisions as you go along. So a quick um, coverage of participants and how they feel about studies. In these many groups, um, having stakeholders who who have disorders or have interest in disorders is key. And um, a group, the Clinical Trials and Autism Council put together a bunch of individuals, some of which there's um, an MD PhD who also has, uh, who has a diagnosis of autism who's on this trial. So it's interesting he held the science hat as well as a uh, patient hat. Um, they put together what their perspective is about trials. And so it's, it helps researchers understand from the participant's perspective what it's like to be in the trial. They came up with this incredibly creative way to describe an experience of being someone who is autistic. And it's really um, fun to look at these things to kind of explain to researchers and clinicians the perspective of the, from their viewpoint what it's like. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna touch upon this, but terms we use are hugely important um, and they're changing constantly. So how we engage with our community is really important for all of this. And then with modern technology, this is a resource that people can use where um, they summarize their information to share with researchers and clinicians. So um, I'm just gonna say a quick thank you to my many collaborators. I mentioned some of them who are on the left, but also my lab from over the years. Um, and, you know, I talked a little bit about, um, uh, I focused on clinical trials, but I've also had NIH and a, a DOD clinical trial funded as well as foundation funding. Um, and, just thinking about um, the huge community um, that we have of researchers and clinicians. And one of the things I have done is created an advisory board for my lab that has um, adult, adults on the spectrum and parents um, on, with children on the spectrum to represent their viewpoints when we're making decisions. And I think that that's really important going forward. Thank you. So we have a little time for questions. So I'm gonna, you know, Tara said she's gonna get it from people on the webinar, but anyone here have questions? Gary. And I'll repeat the question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great talk, so such an interesting and challenging topic that we're all grappling with. So, um, you know, just, just thinking about, I, I get the sense that, that pharma and companies are very interested in digital biomarkers. And I was curious from your perspective, what do you think are some near-term digital biomarkers that could be implemented? Yeah, I. it's true. Um, so the question is, what are some near-term digital biomarkers? I've partnered with some of these groups that have been trying to create them, and they've hit walls because it's so hard to get the data, translate it, and know if it's working. Right. 
Um, and then I even, I was just talking to a colleague recently, if it's a company and the company changes, and we had this with assays, uh, you have an assay that's working and the company goes under, and then how do you continue your work? But the same thing, um, I, I do think near term, I could, you know, things that are simple, that are not too complicated, um, that maybe multiple companies have the same outcome. Um, I, I think um, we've talked before about like sleep mats that measure motion, which are great for kids because it doesn't have to be a watch or something that they don't want on them or they're going to tear it off. But I would really pick something that more than one company is doing and that is not too complicated because um, in one of these trials, we tried this proximity sensor where each family member wore it to see how close they were to each other in the house. And it was such complicated data. It was too hard to really figure it all out with the way that study was designed. So something that's simple that you can test and ideally correlate with something else you're measuring so you know um, you have another proxy for it as well. Dave? Hi, thanks. It was really interesting. Um, this might be an annoying question, but I'll ask it anyway. You go through different uh, designs, biomarkers, heterogeneity, uh, comorbidity. At what point do you decide that the hypothesis is wrong? So um, the question is, at what point do you decide the hypothesis is wrong? And it's, so, it's what I like about some of these Bayesian approaches. Um, I was very much trained in the rigorous um, null hypothesis, disprove, 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 replicate, 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 right? But if it's all or one, I mean, even in those studies, we change our hypothesis to study two or three. Um, I think using these technologies, like it's 80% probable that your hypothesis is right. What's keeping it from going up or down? Um, I do think I do think it's a very complicated, the decision-making around it is one of the challenges. When do you wait? When do you wait for a bigger sample? I think another way to approach it is to really narrow your subsample. So you go in with a very specific subsample, like say within autism, you go around um, kids that have a very specific measure and are repl and it's not changing it much with time, which is really hard because kids are developing and changing all the time. Social is incredibly hard to, to, to do because we all change. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, your social abilities shift. So a very thoughtful design that kind of simplifies some of those things, but you bring in people um, that have it. So some of the designs that I've been really interested in is you phenotype people before they even come in know what and know that it's a consistent phenotype it could be something like genetic um and they're they're only going to represent part of the population or part of the disorder then bring it in with a much more specific um hypothesis and then still do it with this bayesian approach where you're trying to see i mean some of the fragile x work shows well, it's a known genetic disorder but there's huge variability in presentation so how you you then go in you, you try to have some of that done. And again, I'm, I'm now talking about the paradox. You're gonna end up helping, like a lot of my colleagues study rare disorders. You're gonna help a small subgroup and not everyone, but it's that compromise between doing good science and, and also being able to really be flexible. I talked about downstream pathways. So oxytocin, it, it has been studied in like a dozen disorders. It's never meant to be a drug for a specific disorder like a, a, autism. Similar like serotonin, which we use for depression and anxiety, pain and emotional and physical pain, if you look at it evolutionarily, we also need to think about it in a global way, evolutionary way of what these molecules evolved to do and design trials according to that, rather than forcing it into our disorder categories, which is still hard. Um, there's a panel going out. Right now, FDA approves for a disorder. You have to put in a drug. There are groups challenging saying, does it work to go for a symptom or other target? But that's a lot of change over time. We don't know if that's going to happen. All right. Another question? Yeah. Anyone online? <laughs>
Dr. Yeah, Gantt, I can, question too. I can, uh, I can give you one from online. Um, there's a question about whether there was a subgroup showing significant improvement on active vasopressin antagonists. So we really, we started looking at subgroups. Um, and again, it's a complexity question. I myself had done vasopressin genetics, they're microsatellites. So again, they're not um, um, a genetic thing where there you have it or don't, or even there are four variants you can have. There are a dozen plus of long and short. Um, so I think they're still really looking for subgroups. I think it'd be faster to design another trial than some of the subgroup analysis. But I do think, again, if a subgroup shows a promise, you then design the next trial around it and have a faster turnaround between it, as opposed to a molecule being completely dead for everything once it fails a trial. Thank you. You also have compliments in the chat, uh, thanking you for a lovely developmental perspective on clinical trials. I don't know if you want to rotate with the folks in the room, so I'll yeah. let you turn back to them. I'll, I'll do one more from the room. <laughs> switch gears a bit. Yeah. Um, as you know, the interim chair of the department that's busily assembling its first community advisory board, I was intrigued by how you ended, and I wondered mm -hmm. what, what are the most surprising things that came from your community advisory board, yes. and how did you assemble the board? So. Um, Dr. Hansen asked about the community advisory board and how it was assembled, but also what are the surprising things I learned. Um, the assembling is complex. I'm going to hold off on that part of it. But the, the parts that I learned that were so interesting, we had this newsletter. So um, in Minnesota, really built this partnership with large outreach. And it was everything. It was like, interesting things for families, research opportunities, um, articles featuring clinicians and individuals affected by the disorder, all these kind of things. But over time, we really realized that we should probably have at least two versions, one for parents or caregivers and one for young adults or ind individuals with the disorder, because what they wanted to hear was different. And um, Someone who's 25 is very upset to think about what a parent's wish is for the five-year-old child. Again, these are things that are, um, so create things that are, you know, very tailored, more tailored to subgroups. But um, one of the experiences I had, so what I often did is you always get challenged in the field because a lot of um, ad adults or even young adults, I had some great teens, are very comfortable telling you exactly what they think and what you're doing wrong. And I would I would love to sit down and meet with them and hear it. And one of them actually volunteered, helped me get the idea of creating this separate newsletter and then volunteered. He didn't want to be on a committee because he said it's too much work. But he said, I will read and preview your newsletter and give you feedback. So again, I think... Um, on some levels, you need people who have who still want um, to do the work and want to come together and have that. Um, the challenge with autism, often if you see adults with autism, they're the highly verbal that are represented. Often there's a disproportionate number of um, women or girls that are represented because of their ability to speak. So again, how to really represent the whole group and select versus people who are coming together for because they want to work with you on that mission is not always the same. So in a way to just hold both those tensions and maybe even have different groups, one is a feedback group and one is a working group would be what I would think about for our community engagement. Thank you. I, I know that we're just about at the hour, but that last question actually aligned uh, really nicely with one that came into the chat, um, asking what kinds of things patient and family advisory groups list as their priorities for improving lives. Yeah, um, the, the biggest priority is it takes too long. Um, the way we've done traditional science, um, I, you know, I know Dr. Gulzrud and other people have been part of SPARC, which I was a PI on in, in Minnesota, but what they did with genetics is make it a part to give families information back 
And it's still, the criticism is it's too slow because we want to double and triple confirm before we give them anything back. But um, they want to hear what's going on and they want information. And we have to be better at thinking about how to do that appropriately. Um, and then other feedback is to be in the room, be at the table, have a say. Um, we're done with the day of days of like, making decisions without having key stakeholders there. And so um, it makes it complicated. It makes it harder because you'll get a lot of criticism, but then you have to think about um, think about it from the beginning before you even start. Um, so that's those are the things I've learned. Thank you so much. And thank you again for your time today and a terrific talk. Um, I will let those of us on Zoom uh, close out now. Thank you.